Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Amna Navaz. I'm the chief correspondent with the PBS NewsHour. I'm in town from Washington, D.C. Delighted to be here to, thank you, um, to lead this very, very important conversation that's called When the War is Next Door. I have with me here three incredible leaders, mayors of their cities in Eastern Europe, who are all negotiating an incredibly complex set of factors, domestic and international, as Russia's war in Ukraine rolls on, and I think made all the more uh, underscored, I think, by the events of today. It shows just how important their leadership is in this moment. I'll do quick introductions and jump right into the conversation. With me here is Martin Stakis, the mayor of Riga, Latvia. Welcome. Thank you. Also with us is Aleksandra Dulkiewicz, mayor of Gdansk, Hello. Poland. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. And Remigius Szymasius, mayor of Vilnius, Lithuania. Good afternoon. So let's jump right in. I want to know about the impact you have seen of the war in your cities. Mayor Dulkiewicz, I'll begin with you. We know millions of people from Ukraine have fled to Poland. How has that shown up in your city? How are you navigating that? First of all, I think that we cannot really be silent, especially today. This is not only so that this is 229th day of the Russian aggression to Ukraine, and we are getting used to it. We are really here as an international community, not only supporting them being here, but also sending weapons to Ukraine. We can really see it very clearly that half of the missiles were shut down, only thanks to the international help with sending weapons. And this is really important message we should send to our governments, to all influential people in our country. So, of course, Poland was really flooded with people and refugees um, since all those almost more than half a year already. The situation is changing every single day because quite a lot of people were really coming back to Ukraine because they really didn't want to leave their country. They were only escaped because of the war. War. And today, when I was saying goodbye to Andriy Sadov, who was here in the morning, his son is here already in the first row, uh, coming back to his city to be with his citizens. We all need to remember that this help we are having in our country, both Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and uh, Slovakia, and other countries, also Poland, is really helping those brave, brave people to fight for the values we, I believe, strongly believe here in this room, and not only in this room. So this, that we are taking care of the women or children, uh, helping them be in a safe place, is really letting them to be that and fighting for the values. Madam Mayor, your city has grown multifold, right, with the arrival. I mean, most people who've come have gone to cities. Are you able to support them? We are doing what we can, thanks to non-governmental organizations, thanks to activists, thanks to local business, thanks to also solidarity from other European cities. My city was donated from Rotterdam, from Lipsk, from Brema, other cities, so it's friendship again. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing what we can. For example, in Polish schools in my city, uh, we have around 8% of students who are from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it's almost 10%. So this is really issue to tackle, especially language issue, but also mental. Today we have Mental Health Day all over the world, and this is also very important to support them. Mayor Shemashis, I know Lithuania has provided robust services for Ukrainians who are arriving there. Tell us about that, and are you seeing support among the residents of your city to continue providing those resources? I think, first of all, we have to understand what kind of people are arriving. Uh, actually, during the first week, people were electing to come to Lithuania because they thought that Ukraine will fail and we will be the next. In two weeks, the situation completely changed and we have to thank Ukrainians for fighting so brave for Western values. Now, what we have, almost all men who were like immigrants to Lithuania before they left for Ukraine to fight. So, first of all, we had a wave of Ukrainians leaving Lithuania to fight Lithuania to, to fight in Ukraine. Then we have a wave of people arriving, mostly women and children, and 40% uh, are children. And for those who are grown-ups, uh, more than half of them, they are in labor market, actively working. 
it's a typical view. If you go to supermarket in Lithuania, you will hear always announcement that, you know, sorry, not all our employees do speak Lithuanian because we have war refugees. Please be patient. Please address other people and in the hospitality business everywhere is working. I mean, we are glad to have it. I know it in Latvia and Estonia is the same, I guess in, in, in Poland as well. People may work from the second day of arrival. And we were employing people even in our municipality services since the first week in schools or in social services. So in fact, there is no problem concerning refugees. There are other problems, how to solve Ukraine. And this is the, the most important issue. Because for refugees, I was asked a long time ago, even before invasion, so are you ready? So of course we are ready. They were asking me about numbers. And I never said the numbers because it's clear that, you know, as many as necessary. It depends on what conditions. And actually what Polish cities are doing, that's most biggest wave coming to them. But all of us, we are ready to do this. And this, this is not an issue what Western countries tend to remind themselves about uh, refugees from Syria and other, uh, other countries. This is a completely different situation. Mayor Stakis, what about your situation there? I know Riga received some 16,000 people arriving yeah, from Ukraine, and we know there was a policy change, right? You'd originally set up a reception center, but you recently announced over the summer you wouldn't be able to receive any more refugees. Help us understand your decision making. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think we have to say loud and clear. Russia is a terrorist state. They have worse than ISIS. They launched today 75 missiles against the cities where the innocent people are living. And while we are now talking about how to improve the public space, they are destroying public space. They just today destroyed the kinder playground and the pedestrian bridge. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And, uh, and uh, that's how we consider. We should all uh, uh, countries who are sitting here have to admit that they are a uh, terrorist state. Well, our uh, government wasn't ready for this situation. And uh, the story of Riga is a story about the initiative and the leadership. Because we came to the government by saying, well, we have to do something. There's people, a number of refugees in a country, there is no refugee center at all. Uh, and we said, okay, let us do that, do that job. And uh, we made a refugee center, the first one. Uh, and then after two weeks, we understood that it's not enough. We have to make a bigger one. We made another one uh, and it still uh, works and works very well. And when the United, United Nations Commission came to Riga, they announced that this is one of the best refugee centers they have seen. Uh, seven governmental and five uh, municipal organizations working in one, under one roof. Idea is one-stop agency. You come in with your suitcases and you come back, you know where your kids are going to go to the schools, where you're going to work, and so on, so on. And yes, uh, the cooperation between the government and municipality was not always on uh, the best level. And sometimes we even said, okay, it's enough, uh, because our municipality is doing everything, but other municipalities actually are just waiting, and uh, we do have to do something, because all the cities should uh, pay this responsibility. So there was many times, but still Riga is open for refugees every day. Uh, 50 to 60 refugees come to Riga and stays in Riga. We're organizing the labor markets every Monday where refugees and uh, our uh, companies can find employees and start to work. So because they do understand now that they stay will stay for long term. They will not come back uh, in, in, uh, in the nearest future. So, uh, so this is a new situation and we have learned a lot. And I think this refugee center will work for a long time because this was very valuable experience for all of us. Uh, and also, as I said, we as a city are quite open to immigration and to the new businesses. And I think this refugee center in the future will help us also to achieve other, uh, other targets. I just want to clarify one issue. We could talk a lot about the national level and policy, but did you receive any support from your national government to set these resources up or were you sort of left to your own devices? Well, what we did, obviously, of course, and because uh, for the only municipality, it's too expensive. Uh, it's about three, four million in, in months uh, in, in some show, social uh, payments. And, and, uh, uh, but uh, the, the problem is that it's, it's like an army. When you took initiative, you are punished for that. Uh, so, and that's what we did. And <laughs> sometimes we get punished. But uh, it's, 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 that's OK, because uh, as far the refugees are a safe place and they are happy, we are happy. Well, we don't mind. Mayor Dulkevich, are you also viewing this now as a long-term solution, no longer short-term relief? 
definitely long-term solution, but it really depends on our on all of us and the international community how long this war will last. This is really our job, really, to support, uh, to make everything, to make this war um, stop as soon as possible. Of course, some people are saying, uh, those Ukrainians who mm, came to our city, that they are moving somewhere else. They are, you know, when they enter, enter European Union, they can move wherever they, they, they wish, where, wherever they can. Some, they really want to stay and have new life uh, in our city. Uh, but some of them are really dreaming of this uh, coming back home as quick as possible. So there are, in my opinion, one third, one third, one third. Yeah. Mayor Shamashis, I think if the events of today showed us anything, it's that the war isn't likely to end anytime soon. You're likely to receive more people. All three of you are. I'm, I'm curious if you worry that the support you see among Lithuanians to continue providing monthly allowances and medical services and a job portal and like all the things you're providing, are you worried that will wane the longer this goes on? Uh, I'm sure it, it will remain. I mean, I see no sign of support getting smaller. Of course, when people are donating, I mean, Lithuania was the country of like three million people who donated crowdfunded for Bayraktar, which cost more than five million euros in three days. I mean, this, and this support for, for, for military is, is a little bit declining because again, people it's not uh, uh, kind of uh, unlimited resources in, in people's pocket, but support for refugees is, 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 is very, very, very big. But I think, again, when having these challenges, because winter is coming and energy resources, all these issues, and the shelling is continued in Ukraine and people are move, moving, moving to some safer place, either to Western Ukraine, to Lviv, or to other countries, of course we have to address it. And there are two ways to address it. One is to prepare to to accept refugees, and another way is to ensure as safe as possible, as convenient as possible conditions for living. And you know, actually, sometimes it's very important to listen to what people are asking. Uh, I, I was in Kiev for like two days and one day before, before the attack. Then the mayor Vitaly Klitschko says, you know, one thing we ask you to do to be like in this information campaign to, 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 to raise awareness, which is not the issue anymore. Actually, I have some pictures from Vilnius with, with this, like inviting Putin, if, if you will show, inviting Putin to Hague and so on, and then and, and with, with all these nice, 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 um, nice um, uh, kind of initiatives uh, which allowed others to know about it because people were asking, you are so close to Russia, why are you so bold? We are so bold because we are so close to Russia. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the answer. And there's yeah, the picture. Yeah, this, now this maybe you like can tell us what we're seeing there. Yeah, it's, one is about like municipality building about inviting Putin to Hague, and then we change the traffic, mm -hmm. traffic signs. And for, first of all, <laughs> uh, uh, to inform all the truck drivers from Belarus that unfortunately Minsk is occupied by Kremlin now, and that, and that we have like Ukrainian Hero Street on the on the on the, uh, the street where the Russian embassy is. So all the all these signs allowed us to speak about these issues. Actually, exactly what Vitaly was asking for, but now what they're asking for is actually asking to to help people to stay in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and actually glass sheets, plastic sheets, and plastic rolls to cover windows when they are shelled, not necessarily in Kyiv, but maybe in Kyiv. Unfortunately, what we see today is an essential thing, and actually that's what we are doing now. But after it, I think it will be a huge task to help rebuild Ukraine better than it was before. I think this is very important. Not as it was before, but better as it was before, and our help will be very much needed, uh, as, as, at least as, as I understand when talking to Ukrainian friends. I do want to put to you a question that you probably uh, have come up before, but the longer the war goes on, it, it's forced this new question, which is as, as Russians themselves are fleeing Russia with Putin's mobilization and thousands of people now leaving the nation, I, I wonder if any of you have had time to give thought to the idea of whether or not European cities should be offering shelter to Russians who are fleeing <laughs> mobilization. You know, I, I would like to say one remark, you know, uh, I'm very disappointed about German situation right now, because not about Russians, but about Ukrainians, because when I hear German cities saying that, yes, we are welcoming uh, Ukrainian IT developers because it's a boost for our economy, uh, come on, I mean, 
it's, it's, it's so unfair because this is not the right timing to do this, and it's not the right timing to invite Russian programmers or everyone. It's just other things which are on the top of the agenda. So, so for us, it, we have, of course, big discussion whom to allow and whom not because collective responsibility is a fact, but also not a fact. So how to deal with this, this is an issue. But again, there are very simple decisions. First of all, mm -hmm. help first, and then using the abilities of those people Second. Do either of you have a view on that you'd like to share? Well, all the Baltic states and Poland has closed the borders. And uh, we are pretty sure those people are not fleeing, the, they are not against the war, they are against the mobilization. It's not the same. Uh, and uh, first of all, they have to be against the war and against the Putin regime. And uh, if they say how dangerous it is to be on the streets in Moscow, look in Iran, uh, those women are on the streets and they do not afraid. So. So we think that we, she, we have to keep the borders closed, uh, and we will do it. And not only we, I know it's Finland doing the same, and uh, we see the other uh, countries are joining the same policy. Anything you'd like to add? The biggest city, uh, the closest to my city, city of Gdansk, is Kaliningrad. It's only 150 kilometers, but the border is closed. And really, people who were against Putin really escaped uh, fr from yeah, Russia in 2014, 2015, and they were really helping Ukrainian refugees in my city, mm -hmm. working as a translators and real supporters. And nowadays, they're really escaping with their, because they're afraid of their own life. You've spoken a bit about rebuilding efforts and how important they are ahead. Uh, mayor Stakas, I want to ask you about it because you have joined with the mayor of Kiev and President Zelensky and other leaders basically to make a pledge to work together to support sustainable rebuilding. So just from a practical standpoint, what does that look like from Riga? Yeah, that's why we used to... Uh, uh, there was a plan to meet Madame uh, Huzdala von der Leyen, the president of your commission, because we think that uh, it should be... Uh, there should be leadership from the European Union, but the cities must be the ones who do the job. And that's also the message from uh, Mr. Zelensky. He said, we don't ask you the money. We ask you your leadership, your knowledge, your companies. You know how to build the kindergartens, you know how to build the hospitals, better than governments do. So come to and uh, take responsibility for one city and do it your own. I do afraid if those funds or this program will run through the governments, we will lose the time. And this is my message to Madame von der Ursula. I don't know, we will uh, host us uh, uh, on you know, Thursday, Thursday. Hopefully. Hopefully, and Alexander is also coming, so yeah. we will try to persuade her. Mayor Dlokovic, you've talked about the importance of those intercity partnerships. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm a member also of the European uh, Committee of the Regions and head of working group on Ukraine. So there are more really mayors, local leaders, regional leaders who really want to share the experiences, just like we do here during City Lab. So this is something what we definitely need to do to help uh, rebuild Ukraine. And w for example, my city has partner city, which is Mariupol. And this is something really, uh, hopefully, one day Mariupol will be again Ukrainian. Now we don't know it. But we really need to think again how to rebuild those cities in a sustainable way, a better way, just like Mar 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 Marius had said. Mayor Shamashis, I'll give you the last word here. You showed us those public signs of solidarity you've been making. Why are those so important, especially at this moment in the war? The I, I think at this moment it's not so important as it was like six months ago, because back then journalists were approaching me from Ireland, Spain, Japan, United States, asking with these questions about why you're so bold. Then it was important to show it. Now it's clear to all the civilized world who is who, and it's clear that we need to support Ukraine. Now it's a term, the time for more practical steps and also for preparation of rebuilding. And again, when speaking about rebuilding, again, Ukraine is uh, terribly destroyed during World War II and now. And I think Ukraine deserves a better country, better urban structures, better building, and better inspiring, inspiring rebuilding. It's not like reconstructing what it was before. And in this case, I think we have to help to help to believe, Ukrainians to believe that they can have even better country than they had before. So I think it's a very realistic task. Difficult, but realistic. All we need is solidarity. Yeah. Grateful for your leadership. <laughs> Grateful to all of you for being here. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you.